and we are ready to roll. So welcome everyone to the uh, Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on Participatory Democracy. This is our first meeting of 2021. I am excited to see all of my fellow committee members. Hi, committee members. It's good to see you. Um, and, and this is a special meeting because we get to meet Mark. And so Wayne is over having gads of fun over in the um, uh, fiscal division of the LCB. And so he uh, is, won't be joining us, but Mark is now taking over the wonky role of explaining election to us. And I appreciate that because this is where we get to get as wonky as we need to be to understand what's going on. Um, but we, first I'm gonna go ahead and call the meeting into order. And let me make, pull up the agenda to make sure I'm doing this. And I am gonna have Gail do a roll call. All right, good morning, everyone. So Carmen, are you on with us this morning? I don't see Carmen. I didn't hear otherwise from Carmen. Um, and the secretary tried calling me, so I'm going to see if she's having a problem getting in after I call roll. Mr. Coe, good morning. I see you're here. You want to unmute? Oh, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Great. And Chair Cosgrove is here. Yeah. Kathleen Dickinson. Here. Brenda Flank. Good morning, here. Awesome, good morning. Uh, Douglas Goodman. Here. Jane Malorney. Here. Oh, Janie, yeah, you're there. I'm She's here. here. Good. And then uh, Kathy McAdoo is excused unless she finishes another meeting she had she might be able to join us. Um, so that's why I have, and I'll see about getting the secretary on if she's having a problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and so now we're going to go to agenda item number three, uh, which is for public comment. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to read the phone number and then uh, the meeting ID so that when you uh, call in, you'll be able to access our live stream here. So the phone number is 408-638-0968. And then if you can write this number down, this is your meeting ID, 861-4696-1394. And so if you have a public comment, if you could call in on that number, um, we'll wait for a few minutes to give people a chance to call in. Okay, so we have our first public comment. If you can identify yourself and come off mute, you have three minutes for public comment. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out. I think if you're calling in, it's star six to unmute. Let's see if I can unmute them. There we go. Are you there? Okay, we have someone on the phone, but I don't hear you yet. Okay, I see a hand raised. Go ahead. If you're, uh, if you're, Phone number ends in one seven. You can go ahead and speak. All right. I'm not sure why we can't hear them. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on, but we do have public comment at the end. Um, I can see we can, um, if you want to maybe on the Facebook page, uh, put your question. We do have someone watching the Facebook page if you've got questions or comments and they can read them in, but I'm not sure why we're not hearing this person. I don't see a reason. Yeah, you're unmuted, but I, we can't hear you. So I'm going to go ahead and mute. And I don't see anybody else in. And again, uh, if you're having a hard time getting in, we will be doing public comment again at the end of the meeting. Uh, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually 
once we get started, I'm going to send the meeting ID number to the person who's watching our Facebook page so that they can put that meeting ID number in there just to make sure we're getting everybody that wants to do public comment. All right, so the Sandra, next, yes, this is Gail, if I may interrupt, mm -hmm. the secretary was not able to get in without some kind of a code or password with that number you gave me. Yep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that in the chat for you. Okay. And then you can give it to her. Okay, thank you. So if you can give her that, that she'll be able to log in that way. Okay. Okay, the next thing we need to do on the agenda um, is approve the minutes from our last meeting, which was way back on August 19th, 2020. So committee members, um, I'm gonna open it up for discussion. Is there any recommendations for edits or suggestions to change the minutes from that meeting? I don't see any. So I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from our August 19th, 2020 meeting. This is, this is Doug, I move, to approve. I move to approve. Okay, and then Kathleen, would you like to second? Sure. Okay, so I, I have a motion from Doug and I have a second from Kathleen. All in favor, unmute and say aye. 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 All right. So. You muted yourself, Sandra. Yeah, she's muted. There always has to be, so everybody on their bingo card, when the presenter is talking on mute, you, you can mark that one now. It's going to happen at least once. Okay, so um, the next thing on the agenda is we get to meet our new Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections, Mark Valench, Valench, Valenchen, is that right? You know what, I pra Valenchen. I practiced it like all morning long and then screwed it up. So it's Valenchen. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you could go ahead and just uh, introduce yourself, talk a little bit about you, and then if you can go ahead with your report, we would appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to meet you. Uh, as Sandra said, my name is Mark Velashton. I'm the new Deputy Secretary of State for Elections. I uh, took over the position and was appointed uh, back in October. Uh, again, thankfully, uh, my, my predecessor, Mr. Thorley, and I were able to have a pretty lengthy turnover uh, as he transitioned into his new role over at LCB, and, and that gave me a chance to continue my warm start here with the division. Uh, prior to being in this role as the deputy for elections, I had been the previous deputy for operations, uh, and I've worked for the agency a little over a year at that point. Um, again, right outside the door behind me is where the elections division's at. My old office was right next door, so I got to know and work with all of the team well in advance of uh, coming to this role, uh, which I, again, tremendously honored to be in. Uh, so I have two presentations today that I'm going to provide. Uh, the first one is a general overview of the 2020 election cycle. Uh, looking over the minutes from the previous meeting in August, uh, Mr. Thorley, my predecessor, had given a, a report about the primary. Um, and looking at his previous presentations after general elections, I have tailored mine to be similar in nature and uh, providing similar sort of feedback and input. Um, uh, I suspect maybe some folks, uh, not this committee, of course, but uh, you know, across the country weren't as involved or paying as much attention to previous presidential election cycles. Um, so uh, I don't intend to belabor the point. Uh, I think we can have some really good discussion um, and I'm hoping that these slides will provide some information to use that as a really a starting point for our discussion today. Uh, the second slide deck that I will present uh, is involving the elections related legislation that is currently under discussion over in our session uh, just across the mall here from me. Um, also looking at previous years, uh, again, much smaller amount of slides than years before. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll have some, I think, pretty good discussion coming out of that. Um, there's currently 27 that, that I'm tracking now. There's been a slight reduction in the number of BDRs or uh, uh, bill draft requests um, that have been proposed. Uh, there are some more coming, uh, so we'll, we'll have that here in a moment as well. Um, oh yeah, live in Douglas County, married, three kids, wonderful family. Uh, dog and, and a cat, uh, and allergies, which is fun. We'll talk about that later. All right, I will share my screen with the PowerPoint now. Okay, Sandra, is, is that all right? Is everyone able to see? Excellent. Okay, so to start off with, uh, just kind of a nice overview slide uh, of what we, we saw this past year. You'll notice that, uh, and I'll try to call this out, but I'll go back and forth in my comparisons between uh, 2020, uh, 2018, uh, but then also 2016 to compare it to a presidential year. 
Uh, as you well know, most presidential election years typically have a higher voter turnout uh, than the midterms. Uh, but again, as it's the closest election cycle, uh, there's still some, some utility in looking closely at that. Uh, I would be re absolutely remiss if first and foremost, you know, even before diving into the details of, of you know, voter turnout, uh, if, if I did not acknowledge the tremendous amount of work and effort uh, that, that went into this election, not only by the elections division and the entirety of the office of the Secretary of State, but we are a small agency, so everybody pulls together and helps each other out. Uh, so we had folks from across the divisions uh, assisting in the election, uh, like we do every year. It was, it was tremendous to see. Uh, but also the 17 county clerks and registrars and their staffs. Uh, as you all well know, this was a surprisingly contentious uh, election, uh, and there were a number of challenges uh, you know, not the least of which included, uh, oh, I don't know, a global pandemic that they had to look at and, and find ways to overcome given their very unique situations and resources uh, on top of a number of other factors uh, to make sure that this election went as well as it did. Uh, their, their work was the lion's share and I'm truly appreciative and in awe having had uh, an opportunity to watch and see their work. Um, so that being said, uh, looking at this, the voter turnout statistics, uh, again, our active registered voters, uh, again, has continued to trend upward. Uh, the, no anticipation of that changing any time in the near future. Uh, again, and really across the board, uh, you know, some of this, of course, courtesy of AB4 with the, the, that large jump in absentee turnout uh, in the use of the mail-in ballots. And we'll discuss that a little bit later on as well. Uh, again, in, in our overall turnout with 77%, uh, you know, voter turnout uh, still pretty strong. Uh, we were wondering if we were going to get above 80%. Uh, and I know there was a number of, uh, of, of um, inactive voters who may have been canceled and that, that might drive it up going into the future as we continue to improve our list maintenance processes, uh, but still a, a very good showing across the state. A little bit more comparison now, uh, you'll see from the top to bottom, again, uh, some historic data looking at early uh, voting election day and uh, that, that absentee mail-in ballot uh, that I just referenced uh, with 2020's data at the bottom. Uh, again, really, the, the early voting fairly, remained fairly consistent. That's definitely something that Nevada voters across the board are, are uh, eager to take advantage of. Um, and, and a surprising dip in election day voters. I mean, you could see that it had historically been in the 30 or 40 percent, uh, and now it do dropped down to a uh, you know, mere 11 percent. Number of factors across the state, I'm sure, uh, and by locale that, that influenced that. Um, but again, uh, overall, a, a very positive turnout. You know, one of the big questions too that we're looking at as we look at that, that number of absentee and mail-in voters, um, there, there's really no indication of how that's going to go in, in years to come. Um, I, I suspect that there's a number of folks who received the mail-in ballot and used it for the first time during this last election cycle uh, that may have liked it and may request you know, either a permanent absent ballot going forward uh, or may at least uh, you know, be, be curious enough to, to want to try it again, either in 22 or in the 24 cycles, uh, but that remains to be seen. Uh, there all, are also though, uh, based on a number of phone calls and emails and other correspondence we received from voters, uh, a number of folks across the state who are, are not interested in, in voting by mail. And again, I think it's a great thing and it speaks to the, the flexibility of our election laws that we accommodate folks through early voting on election day uh, again, or with a no excuse absentee opportunity as well. Uh, so that folks that don't feel comfortable voting by mail don't have to, there's no pressure and they, they absolutely have the ability to still execute their civic duty uh, in a manner that they are comfortable with. Uh, but that number of, of uh, absentee and mail-in votes is something that we're going to be keeping a very close eye on uh, for a number of reasons. And, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Okay, so these two, uh, the next two slides, this one starts off comparing 2020 to 2016, again, just so that we can look at another presidential election year. Uh, and then the following slide after this one looks at 2018, uh, again, just for the most recent comparison. Uh, some surprising numbers, uh, you know, really uh, in generally going up. Uh, also, by the way, just so you understand the, the color coding context here, um, the way each election is, is scored is that the highest percentage of voters is a darker color green. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the lower percentage of voter turnout uh, is a darker red or burnt sienna, maybe uh, color. I'm not sure exactly what it is. But uh, again, overall, you could see, uh, you know, Humble, uh, Tammy and her team out there, uh, absolutely killing it this last year. Excellent uh, percentage of voters turn, voter turnout in Humboldt County. 
Um, and, and again, across the rest of the state, um, certainly some highs and lows, but again, overall, a really good involvement. And now we'll compare it to the 2018 election. Uh, again, similar and useful for context in that it's closer. Uh, and you can see some of the trends as they are sustained based on the, the actions of voters over the last couple of years. Uh, but again, really you know, pleased but not satisfied, I think is the approach here. Um, the, the question is the folks that didn't come out, uh, were there obstacles, were there issues, were, were they simply not aware of the multitude of ways that they could have voted safely and effectively? Uh, there's a lot of questions that unfortunately don't have answers, uh, but there are things that, that we in the elections division are looking closely at and thinking about and discussing with the clerks uh, to make sure that, again, if, if someone's right to vote, uh, someone's right to not vote also, uh, but, but at least if they are interested in doing so, understanding you know, what options are available to them so that they can vote safely and effectively uh, without concern. I've got a number of other statistics. Uh, again, I looked at the, uh, the minutes uh, from previous meetings uh, and, and I looked at the questions that were asked to my predecessor uh, in, in an attempt to uh, preempt some of the questions. I wanted to provide some of that information now uh, to help uh, again with, your, with the discussion. Uh, so to start off with, uh, signature curing, again, a relatively new thing here in the state. I uh, got the numbers from the primary there. Similar numbers to the 2020 general election with a much better uh, percentage that we're able to get cured. Uh, again, that reflects not only the clerks and registrars and their staff's uh, understanding of the process and ability to, to successfully cure those signatures, uh, but also the public's awareness uh, that this was a thing. Uh, there also are still folks that voted that we were not able to cure signatures, uh, and, and I think that's going to be a key aspect of our voter education going forward, making sure that folks are aware that, again, it's not if you're, if you're using a mail in or an absent ballot, uh, that it's not a uh, necessarily fire and forget that there may be some dialogue and your clerk or registrar may reach out uh, just to confirm the signature if there's any doubt at all in, in the quality of that signature, the originator of that ballot. In regards to same day registration, uh, again, another relatively new uh, feature. Uh, and you can see the numbers jumped pretty considerably going into the 2020 general election. Uh, low numbers back in the primary, likely because of the nature of that, that election. As you remember, it was all mail-in. Um, but with the 2020 general, uh, again, a lot of new registrations and, and some updates as well. And, and again, well, while I think there might be a little bit of voter confusion in regards to what this process is and what it does when you update your registrations, uh, overall, a, a pretty solid program that, uh, again, we're continuing to look at to identify means to improve it and get word out about it. In regards to uh, automatic voter registration, our collaboration with the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, that was implemented, as you remember, back in January of 2020. Uh, again, pretty large number of new registrations. There, there were some questions up front uh, as it seemed to be a trend where most folks that went through the ABR process, uh, or at least a significant portion of them were being identified as either nonpartisan or other um, and that has continued. Uh, again, there's some speculation as to why that may be the case. Um, and again, whether or not voters are aware that if they, if they leave it blank and then it, it, it changes their, uh, change them to a no party affiliation, uh, that, that might be a voter education piece too. But um, again, the fact that folks are getting registered, I think is the key thing that we hone in on. And, and again, making sure that the right people uh, are registering and, and again, building resilience to make sure that nobody that is not eligible to vote is getting registered. So Mark, can I ask you a question right here? Yes, ma'am. So let's say I go to the DMV and you know how the DMV is and I'm all harried and I forget to say I want to be a Republican or a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And so that it defaults me over to nonpartisan. So let's say I, I walk in the next primary, which we have closed primaries, and I'm like, no, I'm a Democrat or Republican. They can change it now at the poll, right? Absolutely, because of the process with same day registrations, it is possible to change your party affiliation. Okay, yep. perfect, awesome. So nobody's gonna be shut out of the primary if that accidentally happens to them. Absolutely not, and that, that's okay. a great question and I appreciate you highlighting that. Uh, again, there, there's flexibility and, and a number of features built into these processes to make sure that we're not disenfranchising folks. And you just touched on a very key part of one. Perfect, thank you. This is Doug, uh, just a, a highlight on that too, because where you can change your party registration at the polls and vote in the primary. Uh, technically, and this was when uh, AB 345 was, came up last session, uh, technically, Nevada has a, I guess you can call it a semi 
open or semi-closed primary system uh, because the key factor of a normal open primary is you still have to be registered as a party to a party to vote. And so with the change, technically Nevada has gotten a slight, a little bit away from closed primary, but uh, that's, you know, in statute, we're still a closed primary state. And thanks for bringing that up, Doug, because I think, I think we're going to see numbers change as people start to realize that if you, when you walk in, you can actually change party affiliation and still participate in our kind of closed primary. So I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see. It didn't happen this last time because every, everybody knows I track voter registration. Yeah, but I, I, I can't it's wait until we get to that. We'll have to see that what new round. In the next primary. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All Absolutely. right. Thanks, Mark. So in regards to our military and overseas citizens, uh, again, this is in regards to their use of the EASE program. Uh, again, from the general, the 2020 general election stats at the top, a little bit of historical context below it. Uh, again, the EASE system was implemented back in 2012. Uh, it, we can continue to gain momentum with the use of this system. Uh, this is another thing, again, when you think about the number of military bases that we have here across the state, and the number of folks, uh, you know, proud Nevadans that are deployed, you know, forward of our shores, uh, this is an amazing opportunity and a truly unique system that, that works well to get them involved in the process, regardless uh, of the time zone that they're in. Uh, increase, again, number of folks using this process, uh, and, and including now as of April of 2020, uh, some voters with disabilities were able to use it. And again, a number of them were able to as well. Uh, in fact, there's a bill in uh, sponsored by Assemblywoman Cohen that, that addresses just that and attempts to codify uh, the use of the of ease by the disabled community um, that it's currently in session. And we'll see a little bit more on that later. So there were some impacts from Assembly Bill 4. Uh, again, I wanted to include this, if only just to, to make sure that we bring it up in case there's some discussion about it. Uh, this slide and the one after it, again, kind of address money, which I, I think is an important part of recognizing what's come out of 2020 uh, and, and understanding that these bills and opportunities may not be here in the future, uh, and that, that's going to have an interesting um, impact on how things go. Um, in regards to uh, Assembly Bill 4, again, we received uh, approximately $3 million, uh, to support the preparation and distribution of mail ballots. Um, it, that supported, uh, you know, the 1.8 million ballots going out, uh, and that includes the cost right below there, that, that, that 2.6 mil uh, includes the printing, mailing, and return postage. So that was a total. And that, that resulted in about a $1.46 per ballot that we sent out. Uh, of those ballots that we sent out, again, 48% of the voters who participated chose to vote by mail. Uh, again, which is what, how we got to that very large and, and, uh, outlier of a number of uh, returned mail-in ballots. Um, and again, while, while we talk about that, it, it's, I think, also important to, to remember now, um, because there has been some discussion about universal vote by mail, um, that, that ultimately, though, 52% of our voters who participated uh, clearly did not choose to use that ballot. Uh, again, neither here nor there, not a bad thing. Again, folks wanted to vote in person, were able to do so, and, and that's a great opportunity. Um, but there is certainly a fiscal cost associated with that. And when you do kind of the quick math on that, uh, it ends up being a, a little bit north of a million dollars uh, that we paid to have ballots printed, mailed, and then put into the trash. Um, so that, that I think is going to be a factor, especially recognizing where we're at as, as a state, you know, fiscally, uh, because of the economic downturn over the last year, uh, moving forward, certainly something worth discussion and awareness of, if, if anything. Uh, and that last number, uh, again, the, the number that were returned undeliverable uh, is something that again, collectively, both the office here as well as the clerks and registrars are keenly aware of uh, and determined to address to make sure that again, our voter rolls uh, which were, of course, in full compliance with the, uh, the processes to clean them. We're in compliance with the federal and state laws that exist, um, but we're determined to make that better uh, collectively uh, going forward. How much of the money that you're showing on this slide came from the federal government through the CARES Act or other st federal streams? So the three million we got from Assembly Bill 4, uh, I think actually, you know what, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, probably best if I get back to you. I know the next slide talks about the 4.5 million we got in regards specifically to the CARES Act, but in regards to how much of the 2.6 million we, the, pull, whether that came from CARES Act or Assembly Bill 4, I'll have to double check. I believe that that was purely AB4, uh, but just to make sure I'll get back to you. Okay, thanks. 
Speaking of the CARES Act, again, we got uh, 4.5 million in funds. Uh, this was, again, primarily used with voter education and supplies and equipment, uh, a lot of personal protective uh, COVID response type of uh, requirements uh, across the counties. So risk limiting audits, uh, we did our, our pilot test of the risk limiting audits uh, this during this last election. Uh, we're going to continue doing them going forward, uh, including during the uh, Boulder City elections. There's a primary in April and then a general in June uh, of this year. Uh, Clark County is going to assist us in another uh, follow-up um, risk limiting audit. Uh, again, for those not familiar with the process, it's really just a, a, another means to validate that the, the votes cast uh, are, are not somehow being uh, changed by the machines uh, and, and that the margins that are being uh, that are, are being reported that are validated. Uh, so again, just a, an extra opportunity for reassurance that the process is working exactly as it needs to be. Uh, these are going to be required going forward in all future elections. Um, and uh, again, we're going to, the four pilots we did went well. Uh, we learned a lot from them. We're going to use that information to help develop our regulations following the session. Um, so that we can continue moving forward with these uh, these programs, the, the risk limiting audit program. Election security. This is something that, again, it's kind of funny when I mentioned to folks, uh, because there wasn't a lot of discussion about foreign interference or, or you know, hacking or, uh, you know, ransomware type style attacks, uh, you, you'd almost assume that maybe we won the war in this regard. And, well, let's just go ahead and cut the funding for election security. Uh, the reality is uh, that clearly is not the best idea. That there were a large number of, uh, of, of incidents of attack origins. And again, I can't go into too much of the specifics, uh, but really I just do want to highlight that ultimately there were a large number of attempts made from both domestic and foreign characters trying to influence our election. Uh, and thankfully, because of the, the, again, extremely important work of the IT officials, not only here at the state, but also in each of the counties, uh, in the multitude and, and, uh, of programs and processes in place, uh, you know, in, in the foresight and, and planning from, uh, you know, Deputy Thorley and, and the rest of the team, uh, we were able to make this, you know, frankly, something that wasn't even really discussed or addressed, or maybe folks didn't even hear a lot about um, during the last election cycle. Um, interestingly enough, though, this is something that didn't stop the day after the election either. Uh, in fact, it continued on for weeks, and in some cases, months uh, after. So there, there's still a, a persistent uh, attempt um, by, by some of these individuals and characters trying to, to infiltrate systems across the country. Uh, I've heard from some of my uh, counterparts in other states that, again, cybersecurity continues to be an issue. Uh, and this is something that, again, we, we are not forgetting about here in the Elections Division. And I know the clerks and registrars and their staffs, uh, again, are very keenly aware of it. Uh, and are continuing to take it seriously. Uh, again, but like anything, uh, elections related, you know, it's not cheap. Uh, this isn't the sort of thing that you can just put together with bailing wire and, uh, you know, 550 cord and duct tape. Uh, this is something that absolutely requires proper funding and attention. And, and so far, again, uh, and as you saw in 2020, uh, it absolutely was funded appropriately. It got the due diligence across the state. Uh, and as a result, it was ultimately a non-issue uh, during the 2020 general election. So moving forward, there's a number of things also, right? Like basically the week after the election, caught our breath for a second or two, uh, and then immediately reoriented and started thinking about how we can improve and look at our systems and processes and what needed to happen before 2022 and 2024, or even 2026. Um, and so going forward, there are a number of initiatives and, and efforts um, that, that we have underway. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, uh, making sure that anybody has access to the statewide voter registration list has more than one requirement to log into. In some cases, it's a thumbprint. Uh, in some cases, it's you know just a series of different methods to, to log in to ensure that the individuals who are doing so are only the people who are authorized to be on the, the uh, statewide voter registration list or, or be touching it. Uh, isolation of elections networks across the state. Again, tying back into the cybersecurity efforts, making sure that, that there are no issues uh, with, with elections networks being laid upon open, uh, non-secure or non-isolated networks to make sure that they have that extra level of protection against uh, anybody, any nefarious actor. Uh, similarly, the digital, uh, isolated digital communications. Uh, there's an effort underway to make sure that we, again, eliminate any sort of redundancy on commercial or open systems 
uh, and a means to, to make sure that our, our communications from counties to state are, are even more secure than they already are. Uh, implementation of a top-down voter registration and election ma management system. This might be something you've heard about as well. Uh, this process is, is currently underway. Uh, our RFP has actually been submitted over to purchasing. Uh, so in the, in roughly about mid-May, we should have some answers back from vendors interested in pursuing uh, this, that, that initial step. The initial step, of course, being the assessment. We're going to have a, a vendor come in, look at the state, gather resources from across the counties, uh, make sure they understand what needs to tie into what, um, you know, to, to make sure this process is done properly. We've talked to about five states already, um, and, and I'll tell you, it's been really interesting being able to be part of these discussions. Uh, we have our, our project manager. She's got a lot of experience with, with these large, complex projects. We've got members from across the elections division involved in them. Uh, our chief IT manager himself, he takes himself away from his very busy schedule uh, and spends two or three hours asking some very pointed questions. Uh, you know, quite frankly, if you were to pick the group of people that were going to be doing this, this is the exact team you would want uh, to manage such a, an important project of this magnitude. Um, one of the things that we've had during these, these conversations with other states that again, have gone multiple hours each, um, they, they stress, you know, take your time in the, the resource get uh, in the, the uh, requirements gathering portion. Uh, make sure that you, again, involve heavily the, the clerks at all the county levels, uh, which is something, again, that we are, are keen on doing. And we're continuing to build this list of their lessons learned so that whatever they said, oops, we messed up on this or we never thought about that. We're making sure that we capture those to make sure that, again, we don't repeat their mistakes uh, and instead just build upon their successes. Um, you know, like, like with a lot of things, uh, you know, if you want it, you know, what's the saying? Fast, cheap, or done properly. Uh, you can only pick two of those. Um, this is something that it has to be done right. And we recognize that, that, that we're, you know, stewards of the, the private information for 1.8 million Nevadans. Uh, and it, it's of the utmost importance that we do this properly so that the, the trust that we have currently in our electoral process remains. Uh, and that there are no concerns or, or even fiscal mismanagement. Uh, you know, we're very, very conscious uh, of our stewardship of the taxpayer dollars uh, as well. Uh, and then ongoing enhancement to the cybersecurity of county and state data. Uh, again, constantly looking at ways we can improve and, and get better uh, and enhance the cybersecurity. Cybersecurity isn't going away as a thing. It's only going to get more complicated, more tricky. Um, and making sure that we stay at the cutting edge of that is extremely important. So there's never a doubt or question about the integrity of our electoral process. Uh, regulations review and updates. So immediately following the, the, the legislative session, uh, we're gonna spend the month of June implementing required changes. Uh, and then from July to October, we're going to do a very in-depth regulatory review uh, across all of 293, uh, and really every all of Title 24, ultimately, uh, to make sure that the regulations that we have in place are accurate, current, uh, and reflect the changes that have come, not only uh, from the, the 19 session, but also during the special sessions, uh, as well as this legislative session too, to make sure that the regulations are clear uh, and very concise. Uh, the intent here is also, so that way, uh, again, anybody that's curious about why things are happening the way they, they do, uh, will be able to look back and either you know, see it in black and white in a statute uh, or looking in the uh, administrative codes to see what exactly the regulation says. Uh, the intent here is also not only to, to help, we'll of course be doing these with the clerks and registrars input, uh, not only to help clarify with the clerks and registrars what that looks like, um, but also so that way we can hopefully shift away from any sort of perception that a, you know, either this office or a clerk or registrar or anybody for that matter across the state is, is just kind of doing things willy nilly. Uh, the reality is we follow laws, we follow processes that are legislatively approved, um, and, and the regulations just simply help clarify that. Um, so we'll, we'll, again, be asking for all of your input and support uh, as we move into that regulatory review, which will be no small feat. Is this where the vocabulary would be? So if people are asking me about what's a contested ballot or what's, was this where it's eventually going to be where we're going to be able to look that stuff up? Uh, absolutely. That, that is very much part of the intent. Uh, there's a number of different definitions that we want to include and update to make sure that, again, we're laying it out very clearly so that voters do have this to be able to look back on. And yes, uh, definitions would be a part of that. Uh, voter education campaign. This is something that we've also identified as being an ongoing requirement. Uh, as we saw, uh, you know, 
you know, I've talked to some of you about, we've realized that you know, our, our microphone um, at a state level and, and certainly as a state agency is, is powerful but limited. Um, and I think this, our true strength comes from being consistent uh, and making sure that we integrate and involve ourselves with, with folks like you uh, to get the good word out about the things that are going on, changes to law, um, you know, I, I thought when I first uh, was appointed into this position that you know, I'd be spending a lot of time trying to explain, I don't know, you know, archaic 1930s or 1890s, you know, elections law. Nope. All the laws that I had to explain were from the 2019 session or the special session uh, just a mere few months ago. Um, so recognizing that voter education, you know, has to continue and we've got to find new and creative ways to reach the electorate uh, so they understand the process. Uh, that, that's such an important part of building their, their confidence uh, and to build that resiliency prior to the 22 and 24 cycles. Uh, undoubtedly, somebody somewhere in 22 or 24 is going to, to allege something about how we do elections here in Nevada that's going to be flat wrong. And the goal is, by that point, if our voter education campaign has worked, folks will hear it and laugh and, uh, and ignore it because they'll know, hopefully by that point, the, uh, the statutes and regulations and how we actually do business. And then lastly, a continued effort to address and respond to the election integrity violation reports. Uh, Secretary Sagaski takes every allegation very seriously. Uh, and while we are a relatively small team, uh, we work as a team and with the counties to make sure that these allegations are addressed. Uh, and if there's anything that we can do about it, we do. Uh, if it's something that is of a criminal nature, then we refer it to uh, the securities division and other law enforcement agencies uh, to make sure that it gets addressed properly. Uh, but that also is a, is a key part of rebuilding that voter confidence uh, here in the state. And, and collectively, right? Like, why, why are we doing these things? Here's the bottom line. Because we got 1.8 million folks who are expecting to be able to do their civic duty and, and believe truly that their vote counts. And it absolutely does. Uh, the statutes explain to us how we need to do it. The regulations provide some clarity. Uh, but, you know, over the last five, six months that I've been in this position, um, you know, I've had some opportunities to speak to voters from across the state. Um, I had folks ask me about their vote history. And when I pull it up and I see like, wow, some of these folks like vote history consistently, you know, for, for decades back when they, you know, back when they first started voting when they were 21, because they, you know, that was what the law said back then, uh, all the way up to, um, it's Friday, right? Uh, Washoe County, if I remember right, has naturalization uh, uh, ceremonies every other Friday. There's folks either this weekend or this Friday or next who are going to be naturalized. Their vote's extremely important as well. It's going to need to count and they need to have confidence in the, in the process and an understanding of what that process is when we get to the 22 and 24 elections. Um, so from, again, the fifth generation of that and all the way up to some of our newest U.S. citizens who are joining us uh, you know, on the rolls here soon, uh, every one of those uh, individuals votes counts and everybody here in this agency takes that very seriously this time, do you have any questions for me? So the uh, Secretary of State was able to join us on the phone. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute her to see if she's got any questions and she can start us off. Let's see if we can get her unmuted. Okay, so I can, there we go. Okay, I unmuted myself. There you are, <laughs> yay. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much uh, for allowing me to be on the phone today. I apologize for that. Um, I think Mark did an excellent job. Um, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that I would correct or change, so um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But please, oops, sorry, please do ask questions if you have any. That would be wonderful. We'd be more than happy to answer anything uh, that you might have. Um, we're uh, working very hard on everything and we're working with the legislators trying to make sure that all of their concerns and their questions are answered. So it's a very busy time for us and um, we just uh, appreciate all of you being here, all the work that you do, and I appreciate my staff. Gail um, did a wonderful job on the minutes and um, Mark, thank you for your presentation, both of them uh, today. And Sandra, that's all I can think of. Okay, well, thank you again for joining us. It's always good to hear you. Thank you. 
So um, that was a lot of information because we changed a lot this last election cycle. So thanks for kind of condensing that down. Committee members, um, do you have questions? Yes, Brenda Flank. Brenda, go ahead. How are you guys? Good. Good. Um, actually, I took a couple of notes as the presentation was being made. So Mark, I have a few questions for you. I'd like to go back to your discussion about DMV and the registration process. And somewhere there, you said something about verification of eligibility. Do you know anything about at, like the time frames and what point does someone actually become a registered voter? How long does the verification process take? So the, the verification process from automatic voter registration. So when they fill out the paperwork uh, at the DMV, uh, again, part of the request there is, is for driver's license. Uh, if they have a driver's license number, uh, if not social security number, um, the paperwork ultimately gets sent to the county clerks who review it. Uh, if there's any question about the eligibility of that individual, they'll reach out to that, uh, that um, prospective uh, voter. I think it's probably a, decent term for it. Uh, they'll reach out to that individual and ask them for, for clarification to make sure that they, they do meet eligibility requirements. Uh, the process though, because of that, that interaction, the back and forth, it, it can take a few days, it can take a few weeks in some cases. Um, if the individual who's doing automatic voter registration has a, a driver's license on them, it can be instant. It can, you know, again, with the real ID, they can show that they have uh, residency and that they, because they have the driver's license, they've provided the other paperwork. So it can be instantaneous, uh, but when in doubt, it, it can typically take a few weeks to make sure that that individual really to confirm or deny that individual's uh, eligibility. Does oh, that answer okay. your question? Uh, yes, it does. Because specifically, I were talking about people that don't necessarily have what they need at the time. They're there and may not have what's needed for uh, registering as a um, voter. The other question about the, and you brought up again, the same day elections or registration. At what point are those, maybe you could explain that process. When someone reg, uh, registers same day, they want to vote, what happens with their vote? Okay, certainly. So an individual uh, shows up to the polls, um, maybe they've been hard at work, maybe they weren't able to, for whatever reason, register to vote beforehand. Um, when they show up to vote uh, and they identify themselves as, as being uh, interested in registering to vote on that same day, they're actually given a provisional ballot to make sure that, um, uh, again, they, they are able to vote. They vote on that provisional ballot. That ballot is set aside uh, along with their registration paperwork as well. Uh, and then a similar process occurs. Before that ballot is cast and included in the aggregate count, uh, the county clerks first and foremost have to verify that they are eligible to vote, that they haven't uh, registered to vote in another county, those, those sorts of things. Um, there's a, so there's a little bit of a process there. Uh, it, it takes, again, depending on uh, you know, the, the county, I mean, there's a statutory amount of time that's allowed um, where all the counties collect their provisional ballots. They report those provisional ballots to the Office of the Secretary of State um, so that we're aware of those, those provisional registrations. We get to compare them so that we can make sure that nobody's registering both Clark and Nye, for example. Uh, and once we confirm that they have not, uh, then again, and the clerks have uh, validated that they're eligible to register, uh, then the ballot will be cast um, appropriately. Oh, okay. That really clears some things up because there's, of course, we all know there's been a lot of discussion about things that may or may not have happened in this last election. Uh, one last question, and then I have a comment. Um, you spoke about the regulatory review that's coming up. Now, is that like an audit of some kind? No, so uh, yeah, it, it's not, not really an audit. Um, not administrative codes um, are, are regulations that, that describe how uh, you know, really the statutes uh, can be implemented. Uh, in the statutes, in certain parts of Title 24, it says the, the Office of the Secretary of State, and really specifically the Secretary of State, has the ability to create regulations to enact the provisions of this statute. 
Uh, when, when we see that in a statute, uh, what that tells us is that um, it's probably fairly general what, what the statute is referring to, and there's an opportunity to provide more clarity uh, in regards to how that statute is going to be enacted. Um, reasons could include uh, you know, standardization of certain processes uh, across the state. Um, or identifying what paperwork needs to be turned in, or, or in some cases, what the format of a, a certain template or a document looks like. Um, I remember seeing that there's actually a, a recommendation that about every 10 years, uh, you know, the administrative codes uh, should be reviewed in their entirety, along with the recommendation that after each uh, legislative session, administrative codes should be reviewed as well. And when I say administrative codes, the same, I'm using it synonymously with regulations. Um, so because of all the changes really in the last you know, three, four years, uh, our intent after this legislative session uh, and in light of the, the large number of elections related uh, bills that are, are up for discussion, uh, plus some discussion about uh, you know, HR1 and S1 and, and some of the changes that may come out from those, uh, our goal is to, to set aside time so that we can look at our regulations from start to finish and critically think about each one. This is actually something, again, the elections division isn't waiting till after session to start. We, we started it months ago uh, with the intent of, of researching, identifying, looking closely at these regulations uh, so that we can build a list that we compile so that we can recommend to the secretary which ones we think should be updated. We'll have some discussion about that and then we'll start the regulatory review process, which includes workshops, uh, that, that again are all uh, subject to open meeting law. So we'll advertise them and agendize them, uh, make sure that everybody gets the Zoom or in person, uh, you know, depending on, on what it looks like moving forward, uh, just so that we can involve as many folks as possible to get feedback. Um, the way we'll set up the regulation review is that it, it'll be by subject. So it's not gonna be, uh, you know, hey, we're gonna have one workshop and it's gonna cover, oh, I don't know, 600 pages of regulations. Like the intent will be to, to carve out sections that we can discuss uh, very specifically about wording and, and phrases or what the requirements are uh, moving forward uh, with, with the goal being completion uh, by about October, late October uh, of this year. Um, the idea being that again, by having the regulations completed um, and, and hopefully approved through the legislative commission by that point, uh, then we can start the new year uh, with new regulations that we've discussed with the clerks that we're all on board with, that we've had a chance to incorporate into our voter outreach uh, so that, that folks can hear what exactly the updates were. Uh, and we can jump into January 2022 uh, and really focus on that new election cycle uh, with a fresh batch of regulations. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Um, there at the end with this process, once it makes it back to the Secretary of State, it goes no further than that, right? This is more of a just an in-house, nothing goes back to legislators or anything for review because this is just about the language. So there is, there is uh, legislative involvement. Uh, the legislative commission gets involved and, and again, ultimately has the ability to approve or deny uh, and be part of these discussions oh, okay. as well. Oh, okay, great, okay. Uh, last thing, th this is just a comment when you were talking about the absentee mail-in ballots and the cost, the fact that 52% of the ballots that were sent were put in the trash. That's money that's thrown away. Hopefully we'll get back to the point where people can make a request for a ballot absentee and leave it at that. And we have plenty, well, 2020 was an unusual election cycles so but polls are open people have access to vote and the waste of the money is just i i was shocked at the 52 percent yes ma'am uh, we're putting you know not returned and you're, you're touching on, on honestly one of my favorite aspects of how we run elections here in nevada right the fact that we have the the very generous, you know, early voting period that you can vote on election day if you want, uh, or, or if you're, you know, unable to do those, uh, then, then you're able to request an absentee ballot uh, so that you can still be involved in the process. Uh, I love how that that absolutely meets the requirements from, you know, the, the hardworking folks in our rurals to the hardworking folks in our urban areas. Um, you know, the folks that work around the clock can still find a way to get involved in the process. Uh, it's amazing and, uh, because 
when I first voted, you vo there was one day to vote, election day. And now we have weeks of early voting all day. And so I think the uh, discussion about people being unable to vote, I think that that needs to be really looked at seriously because there are options. So hopefully the absentee will still be in place and no mail out mass voting, which is just a waste of taxpayer dollars. So that's all I have. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Brenda. So Mark, that re Brenda's comment reminded me that the last one Wayne presented to us the last time, he said that your office was working on like an automatic way people could go online and order their absentee ballot so that you didn't have to print the format. Can you update us on what happened with that? Absolutely, a, a great question, thank you. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Uh, Deputy Thorley, uh, under the direction from the secretary, uh, began a project to implement and change the way you request an absent ballot. Uh, so now, uh, again, it's a simple click of a button online when you look at your uh, voter registration information, uh, you just simply say, yes, I want a permanent absent ballot sent to me for all future elections uh, to make it even easier for folks. Uh, Doug? Yeah, th this is Doug. Uh, Brenda and others too, we, if given your comment on, uh, you know, being able to request ballot, uh, the speaker has AB 321, which will make uh, basically AB 4 permanent, which will mail, automatically mail ballots to all voter, all active voters. So that's a bill you may be interested in following because uh, most likely it will pass given the legislature makeup. Uh, most likely it will be signed. And so the requesting of absentee ballots would be gone. And that would be interesting right. then because in the challenge for the Secretary of State's office, as you said, and I was shocked by that by that number too, uh, to that control how, how best to control that expense. Right. Yes, Doug, that is why I asked that question because there has been a lot of uh, discussion about AB 321 and trying to get our legislators to understand perhaps we need to address them at a cost point rather than any other, you know, how we all have our positions that we take when it comes to issues. Right. But talk about the cost should uh, influence, I would think, some of our legislators. So, well, give, uh, give Doug, I didn't want to hear that it would likely pass. I, I was being hopeful, but uh, given <laughs> given it, that also just the turnout figures that Mark you presented earlier in the in the presentation, uh, given the other five states that do all mail ballots and whether or not it shows the newness uh, of it here in Nevada, uh, I was actually surprised. Uh, with the turnout being below 80%, I actually thought, given the convenience factor, that we would be well over 80%. Uh, so uh, it's going to be interesting whether or not that's another uh, argument uh, in testifying when AB 321 comes up for a hearing, something that needs to be pointed out. You know, that's, that's just for discussion. But that, again, just for the comment that mm -hmm. I was a little surprised with, given that and what other states that do all mail voting experience with turnout. Right. And, you know, Doug, actually interesting point on that. <clears throat> um, there, there, was, there was some discussion earlier, you may remember about a number of uh, inactive voters uh, in Clark County that were going to be removed from the rolls. And there was a timing issue where uh, they ultimately were put back on the, the rolls. Um, if those individuals had all come off, then we would have been above 80, uh, 80%. Um, which so again, it's it's some of those individuals again, uh, quite frankly, updated their registration and voted during the election anyway. They simply had just moved from one location to another, um, so it, it wasn't as though all of them had vacated. Uh, but that that would have affected the numbers. Okay, thank you for for yeah, adding that's that. That's interesting. And I know Mark, you're going to look at legislation, but does AB three twenty one have an opt out for mail in ballot mail in ballots? It does actually. So it, okay. it's kind of funny. The uh, the radial button that we put on uh, registered voter services, we have to flip it from opting permanently into uh, absent ballot to maybe permanently opting out of absent ballot. Um, but yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, any other committee members? 
questions? That, it makes a lot more sense for people to be able to opt in and make the request instead of opting out. Because right. there are a lot of people that don't have access or don't want to or don't know what this opt out option is. It sounds easy for us to say because, you know, that clicking a button or whatever, having that kind of access, that's good. I think that people should opt in and make the request and it'll save our state a lot of money. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, Kathleen, Ron, questions? Anything? All right, Mark, you're getting off easy. We'll let you go into the next presentation. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, before I start this one, I, I do want to clarify a couple things. So this one, the following presentation is uh, 30 slides um, of which again, an intro and a conclusion, right? So, or, or, uh, so really 28 different uh, elections related proposals. The last one that we're gonna talk about very briefly is HR1. Um, but of the rest of them, <clears throat> again, this is interesting because uh, as you know, there are deadlines in the legislature for when bills need to be presented and identified. Um, that, that rule has been suspended. Um, so as a result, while we have 27 then, I think that, uh, that we're gonna be discussing today, there's a very real possibility that more are coming. And in fact, I found out about, uh, there's a new assembly bill just this morning uh, that, that, that proposes some things. And I'll, I'll make sure I talk about that one here as we get to the end of the list. Um, but so again, uh, a significant amount, let's say, let me jump into the slides real fast. I'm not getting ahead of myself. Perfect, look all right. Excellent. Okay, so again, there's a number of different uh, bills that, that we're looking at and that we're tracking pretty closely. Uh, again, a couple things to keep in mind. Um, due to the large number of these bills, uh, we, we've had to prioritize and kind of weigh um, you know, the resources that we have available to look at these uh, with a number of competing priorities. That being said, every one of these that we talk about today has gotten a very close look. Uh, there's been a, a fiscal note request uh, on just about all of them, or if there isn't, then we have a draft one and we're ready for it as soon as it comes up and we may do a, an unsolicited fiscal note if, if somehow one of them slips through the cracks. Uh, and again, those sorts of fiscal notes really just identify the way we do the process is we reach out to the counties and kind of find out you know, what, what sort of impact they think they would have, uh, especially of note is, is what are those things that they think they're going to say, here's what I'm gonna pay for at the county level, and then I'm going to request compensation from, from the state um, so that there aren't any hidden costs as well. Uh, there's a, a, certainly a lot of things that the, the counties will absorb on their own. Uh, so we look closely at these, uh, not only from a fiscal point of view, but you know, again, from an education standpoint. Uh, across the board, one of the things that we've talked about, is, as I've mentioned before, is the extreme importance of voter education. Uh, and so as kind of a standard in just about all of these, as they, they come our way, uh, we make sure that we have a fiscal note that identifies uh, if you do this, it's a fairly small, in, in some cases, some cases pretty large change, uh, but we're going to need to get out and talk to voters about this so that they understand what's going on and what that looks like. Uh, in the past, as you remember, during uh, the, uh, before the primary and for the general, uh, we used postcards, uh, we had uh, you know, advertisements on, on radio and, and on Facebook and elsewhere, uh, you know, those sorts of things would likely be the sort of style of method of communication. Uh, but again, we're looking closely and very critically at what was effective um, and, and how we can get the most word out about all the changes that are coming up. Um, so that being said, uh, what I plan on doing here is I'll kind of run through these. Um, the intent is to, to kind of talk about them in general terms. Uh, I'll take a few seconds per slide. Uh, so that way, if you do have a question, I, I won't close the slide deck out completely so we can pull it up and reference it. Uh, if there is one bill or another that you have a particular question about uh, or that I can perhaps provide some insight to. Uh, and you'll notice as the, kind of the format for the slides, title across the top and sponsor if we're aware of it. Uh, and then all the way down through with, with the summary and then the asterisks at the bottom. If we have any uh, updates, uh, some of the team provided um, the latest uh, update as well. Uh, and I appreciate Mr. Casa helping out with that uh, to make sure that we, again, have the most accurate information. Okay, so starting with Assembly Bill 121. Uh, this was the one I referenced earlier from uh, Assemblywoman Cohen. Uh, the intent here is to codify the use of ease uh, for voters with disabilities. Uh, this is something that, uh, again, 
uh, Secretary Sigaski is in uh, support of, uh, and as an agency rather, we're in support of, um, and has already been heard. Uh, again, very, fairly straightforward in, in regards to a fiscal impact outside of an education campaign, uh, there really wouldn't be much impact to the agency. All right, Assembly Bill 126. <clears throat> uh, this one uh, sponsored primarily by some, uh, sorry, Speaker Frierson uh, and, and a couple other folks. This also provides uh, for a presidential preference primary to be held on Tuesday. A uh, good spot as any to, to identify the fact that you're gonna notice that a handful of these are going to sound like maybe I said them already. Uh, there are a number of BDRs that talk about presidential primaries. There's a number of BDRs that talk about list maintenance uh, or that talk about other elections related uh, items. Um, really, when you, when you kind of think about it and you zoom out from, from looking really closely at any one bill, uh, I think it's important to recognize that the legislators that sponsored and identified these, these bills uh, are really just echoing their constituents' concerns, right? And, that, and that's something that here in the Elections Division, we've, we've tried to you know, look critically at. Uh, if, if there's a lot of questions about list maintenance, well, we've already begun a process to review and think about how we do list maintenance and make sure that, again, we know we're already in compliance with federal and state law, uh, but, but are there means that we could be doing it better? Or, or is it a voter education campaign, again, to explain to people what we're doing um, so that they don't think it's being done in the shadows or, or again, uh, without any sort of clear process? Um, so, so as we go through these, again, you'll notice some redundancies. Uh, there are definitely changes and, and differences in all of these. Uh, even the ones that do sound like they're generally the same. Um, but again, uh, the, what we're trying to do is not only look at each individually, but then also uh, to look at the overall message that's being conveyed uh, through these different um, bits of legislation. So uh, this one, uh, Assembly Bill 26, again, provides for presidential primary uh, in January. Uh, a number of fiscal concerns here as well. And, and talking to the clerks, uh, everything from when you back it up, uh, into the holiday season, some concerns and discussion about, you know, what does that look like uh, when distributing mail-in ballots, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, which, which is, by the way, another part of uh, 126 as well. It, it would make this presidential preference primary uh, an all-mail uh, ballot um, election as well. Um, so even, again, from a very practical sense, we're sending out ballots. Uh, how does that work when everyone's also at that same time leading up to the uh, election now getting uh, you know, holiday mail and catalogs and, and those sorts of impacts. Uh, combine that with the concerns raised recently by the post office, adjusting some of their timelines, uh, and, and there could be some, some interesting second and third order effects uh, that we're paying close attention to and, and, and again, trying to identify uh, so that we can provide that information uh, to the, the decision makers who are looking closely at this bill. Mark, Doug, sir. Uh, has there been uh, any input yet from the counties on the fiscal note? Because this is going to be huge. Uh, yes. Because this is a, uh, a added, adding another election in January. Uh, and for those who may not realize, uh, the caucuses are paid for by the parties, uh, not by the state. So this is going to have a huge fiscal note. Uh, have the counties started to provide any input to this yet? Yes, they have. Uh, excellent question. Uh, and thank you. Yes, this, this one, absolutely. Uh, there, there are a number on here. Um, you know, that we saw as soon as it popped up, um, kind of stopped the presses, immediately took the bill uh, and got it out to the counties so that we could start discussing and give them as much time needed to, to look into it. Um, and, and the one that actually came up today, that was, a, I think, a pretty solid example of another one that, that as soon as we saw the language in the bill and, and understood what was being discussed and proposed, uh, we reached out to the counties. Uh, that, that collaboration is so incredibly important to get their on-the-ground feedback uh, as it relates to each county. So, yes. Mark, Brenda Flank here. What is the reason, what is the purpose of a bill like this? I mean, what are they trying to accomplish? The end goal, I guess. You know, it's an excellent question. Um, Perhaps you don't have the answer. <laughs> I was, was going to say, I'm, course, I'm, but... I'm able to provide fiscal impacts, uh, you know, right. in, in some of the concerns of the clerks. Um, but that, the I think really is where my lane is. Okay. Just wondering. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Uh, Assembly Bill 129. Uh, this one uh, relates to political action committees uh, and identifies a different threshold for reporting. Um, 
again, this one was uh, heard fairly recently. Uh, again, some discussion about it. Uh, the, the office is neutral on this one. Assembly Bill 134. Uh, again, this one uh, repeals actually a, a number of the provisions set forth back in, uh, in 84 from the 32nd special session. Um, again, there's, there's in a similar means that there were a lot of uh, bills proposing certain aspects that were, were kind of common threads like list maintenance uh, and the like. Uh, there were also a number of bills again that, that looked critically at, at elements of AB4 or, uh, or at AB4 in its totality uh, and, and were requesting a complete repeal of it as well. Assembly Bill 137, uh, this one identifies, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a few things as well. Uh, proof of identity for voting in person, uh, talks about some of what the different types of forms of identity would be, um, and then requires the DMV to issue a voter ID card uh, at, at no cost. Assembly Bill 163, uh, Again, similar in that, again, this one has a, a voter ID requirement. Uh, it, it also authorizes cities or counties to use uh, blockchain technology uh, with, within certain voting systems. Uh, there were a number of changes to deadlines as well, uh, it would, which again, I think expressed some of the concerns from uh, some constituents of theirs uh, across the state that had concerns about the delayed period of time after election day uh, before re results were certified excuse me, uh, along with a number of other, other concerns. Assembly Bill 166, um, again, sponsor, this was sponsored by Assemblyman Hafen, really updates the language of the statutes. Uh, there's currently a statute that identifies a requirement to put paid for by on any yard sign over a certain threshold, uh, $100, for example. Um, the intent of this uh, uh, Assemblyman Hayden's bill is to simply incorporate text message into that requirement as well. So the electronic communications you know, that, that pop up on your phone, um, you're able to identify the originator uh, of that individual or that organization rather that may have sent the, the text message. SB 79 just uh, provides for the incorporation of the city of Laughlin. SB 84 uh, changes the max number of active registered voters uh, in any specific election, elections precinct, uh, changes it from 3,000 to 5,000. Uh, this is something that, that both the, the registrars of Washoe and of Clark uh, are, are advocates for. Uh, in part, they said because of the, the number of increasing apartment complexes and the population densities in those two counties uh, that would help them. SB 85, <coughs> excuse me, uh, authorizes write-in voting uh, for statewide and federal offices. Uh, some other states do that. Uh, again, this is something also that the, the office is neutral on. Which, by the way, again, with, without exception, uh, if, if I don't say anything, then, then we are neutral on it, just for clarity. Uh, SB 101, uh, this one identifies or authorizes a registered voter um, so that if a registered voter wants to have the, when you check into the polls, uh, if you want them to ask you for ID, uh, that's what this bill proposes. Uh, it, it's not a mandatory ID requirement across the entirety of the state. Uh, it would be optional, something again similar to the opt-in to uh, you know a, a, um, a mail-in ballot, uh, something along those lines where you could click on something and then it would just it would flag you as, as wanting to have to show your ID uh, when voting in person. SB one twenty one creates the nonpartisan blanket primary system. Uh, again, the idea being that for candidates on a single primary election ballot. Uh, again, really, this would eliminate our closed primaries uh, and then allows for the two candidates with the most votes in the primary to advance to the general election. Assembly Bill 218 uh, by Assemblywoman Titus. Uh, this one is to authorize a sheriff or constable to campaign uh, wearing their, their uniform. Uh, AB 248 
Um, this one, again, goes back to partisan observers um, and, and trying to identify requirements, um, not only for those observers, uh, but also trying to identify what are and, and clarify uh, the clerks and registrar's plan for allowing the, the um, election observers to how to observe an election. Uh, her concerns here uh, came from some of the complaints and uh, concerns that her constituents expressed to her uh, regarding the ability to observe um, the electoral process at the clerks and registrar's offices uh, and making sure that it's as transparent as possible uh, while, while, again, not really getting out of control. AB 263, uh, this one talks about the county and city clerks uh, and auditing the performance of folks who check the voter signatures. Uh, the idea being that, again, while there's training already that's involved and required for folks that look at the, uh, the voter signatures, and ultimately that's something that the registrars and clerks uh, ultimately sign off on their, themselves, uh, providing for an, an audit process uh, to make sure that the individuals who are doing this work are, are trained, and then there's a level of validation that goes into it as well. <clears throat> And then also clarifying for signature verification devices. Yes, Doug? Just, just, just a note on this too. Uh, this feature has actually been added into uh, the, the speaker's bill. I think what I said that was AB 321. This actually is in that bill as well. So yep. uh, it's that's just an interesting uh, point. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, right? like a bipartisan, uh, something that, that both sides agree. Like, again, I, I don't see it as a, an error from before necessarily that needs to be corrected, uh, but you can see that, that collectively the, the desire to make sure um, that, that if there's a doubt anywhere in the process, that it should be clarified. If there's questions about who checks voter signatures, then we probably should audit those individuals to make sure that they're not, again, just doing it however they want, but making sure that in addition to what they're already required to do, that there's an auditory process uh, that will help reassure voters uh, after the fact. Uh, Brenda Flank here. Mark, about those uh, devices that verify mm -hmm. signatures, are they part of, well, maybe a better question is, these are actual people looking at signatures and they're not being verified through a machine? Yes, ma'am. This, this, this bill actually touches on both. Uh, and it's actually, it originated from uh, uh, a regulation that Colorado has actually, because they've been using these sorts of machines and, and you know, all mail-in ballots for some time. Um, it, but it looks at both. It, it establishes an uh, audit process for the individuals, the, the humans that are checking the signatures, as well as clarifying what the requirements are for the machines. Uh, and the machine, the, the, the machine specifically that Clark County uses, um, you know, is one that's used you know, in many cases across the country in different uh, various uh, states. Um, but the idea would be to clarify and increase the level of, of tests that are done to that machine before and after the election. Very similar to the, uh, the logic and accuracy testing that we do for the, all the other voting machines. We do our pre lat testing before the election uh, where we run ballots basically through a machine, make sure that the ballots that we put, you know, ABC, ABC type of thing, come back out and are read exactly how we inserted them. And then we do that again after the election to make sure that those voting machines work exactly like they say they, they do. This would apply that same sort of methodology and thought process to the, the machines that do the, the signature verification as well. Uh, so that there was, there was even less question about why or how the machines are working the way they do. At what point so, does a person- Oh, I'm sorry. Sandra. Yeah, so Brenda, are you asking at one point does a person look at the signature as opposed to the machine? Yes. Yeah, and, that, I was wondering that too. Okay. The, so the machine, at least again, this is really Clark specific right now, uh, but the way that the machine was set up is that when there's any doubt at all, it spits it out for human verification. Any doubt at all. It, it does not, it's not a, well, kind of a close enough, like nope, the machine, if it doesn't hit a certain metric, then the machine spits it out. And that's, that metric is surprisingly low, increasing the number of human uh, verifications that are required. Uh, and that's part of the reason why, again, the, the intent here, I think, from this bill uh, is to, again, at the very least, codify what, what sort of checks and balances we have on both the people and the machines doing that, that very important work. So does this happen on these devices, signature verified ballot is sent through a machine, or, or is there like some, like two different processes going on here? They verify the signature and then count the vote 
if it's not uh, verified, then it kicks out the vote. Yes, yes, that's that's very very similar. So um, the, the very first step in the process for a mail-in ballot is to look at the signature and make sure it matches the one that's on file, uh, because as soon as that ballot comes out of the envelope and is separated from the envelope, uh, you know, for the purposes of secrecy, uh, you really can't rejoin them again. So the very first step is validating the signature and make sure that the the name on it matches what's on that individual's voter registration file. Uh, the way it works in Clark, because of the large number of voters and roughly 1.2 million folks down there that, that vote um, for all the mail-in ballots, the first run through goes through the Agilis machine. Anyone that's even remotely in doubt and even you know, for a, has a hint of not matching exactly what their signature is on file, it spits it out uh, to the, off to the side so that humans can then take those and go through and, and do a, uh, an, an actual, uh, the follow on uh, signature verification. And, and what's, what's different about that? Well, when the, the people do it, when the, the uh, signature verifiers are doing that, they pull up that individual's voter registration data file and get to look at everything from the last signatures they use. They look at if the individual registered to vote and hand wrote on that paper, then they compare it to all the different letters and words that are used to, you know, all these different examples of the individual signature to make sure that it's accurate and, and, and matches. Uh, if it does, then it goes to the next step where the, the ballot and the envelope are separated. Uh, if it doesn't, then it goes over and it gets flagged for a signature curing where, again, a letter, text message is a number of different ways the counties are able to do it. Reach out to the voter and say, hey, we got questions about your signature. We need to talk to you uh, so that we can validate your signature and that this is, in fact, your ballot. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So once the ballot is actually sent through, and I'm trying to remember, we don't actually sign our ballots, do we? No, ma'am, just, just the envelope. Just the envelope. Oh, just okay. Envelope. So I was thinking there was some other way to make sure that, yes, that is, in fact, the signature of the uh, voter. And, and, you so, know, that's a great point, too, right? It, it ties into our voter education because... Uh, you know, I've, I've talked to people, unfortunately, that said that they signed their envelope and then they signed their ballot just to make sure that there were no questions. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that if you sign your ballot, then it's spoiled and it actually doesn't get counted. Um, so it's important to make sure that folks are aware that, again, that the validation piece happens on the envelope. Um, and, and again, that it's matched to the system. So if, if your ballot is rejected, then it, what happens at that point? That's, that's when it goes to the signature curing process, where the, the county clerks and registrars uh, reach out to the individual voter, um, usually through a, a number of different ways, uh, but, but the opportunities are through phone calls, through text messages, uh, through letters or postcards, notification, um, in, in order to let that voter know that their, their ballot has not been accepted because their signature needs to be cured or validated. Okay, so their ballot is still in that envelope, right? It yes. hasn't been processed. That's correct. Okay. So what happens if you get through the process, the signature has been verified, goes through the machine. What happens if that ballot like rejects or something? So the, if, if the signature is good and the ballot is separated from the envelope and the ballot is processed, or maybe in some cases there, uh, if it's a, a maybe the, the ballot may have been torn or uh, maybe have been uh, the rain got on it or something, uh, there is a duplication process with a bipartisan pair of folks that, that will duplicate that ballot if it doesn't actually, if it won't go through the machine to be counted. Um, but uh, again, really just to make sure that it, it, it one, again, that bipartisan board makes sure that it's, it's duplicated accurately uh, and then is allowed to continue on through the process. So uh, you guys don't. Uh, or the election department don't notify people that their ballot has been duplicated, right? They just do it and then yes. send it through. Yep, exactly. Is that what happens? Yes. So is the volume so much on duplicated ballots that they can't notify some, you know, that uh, voter? Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's come up as something that the, I guess one to answer your question, the, the volume, it, it isn't as bad as, as you might think. Uh, it's a surprisingly small number of ballots that, that are rejected by the machine because they're torn or, or were wet or something along those lines. So 
Um, I, I can get you the statistics on how many were actually duplicated. Um, I don't have that in front of me. Um, but in regards to notifying voters, I, I think the, the intent is once the individual casts their vote and puts it into the mail or uh, you know, turns it in in Carson City, if, if there's questions about that, the goal is to, to get it to a point where it can be processed uh, in, in the exact format and, and you know, again, matching very closely mirroring what was on the ballot in the first place so that there's no question or, or discrepancy there. Um, but, but I think, I don't, I don't know if there's ever been anyone requesting to know about a, a duplication. Well, and we also, what? we Maybe also have this. Oh, I'm sorry. No, so, um, Brenda, we have the, everybody's entitled to cast an anonymous ballot. And so they try really, really hard not to associate a name to a ballot because yeah. you wouldn't want somebody feeling like they were going to be intimidated or, or, or there was something nefarious going wrong, going on because they put your name on your ballot because we want to make that, sure that it's voting anonymous. And that's a great point, Sandra, and something I kind of completely walked by anyway. By that point in the process, they don't have the name anymore anyway. So they're, they're not even able to notify them. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't know the, the duplication process just... Mm -hmm. And, and it's supposed to be two people that are, or yep. a group of people that's duplicating this. Exactly, ballot. always a bipartisan group uh, across every step in the process uh, to make sure that there's there's nothing going on. Well, Mark, this is Doug. Uh, I don't know if I'm looking through my notes, but I and I don't remember the bill number, uh, but it talked about adding a identification number to the ballot itself and to the sample ballot that somebody sent yes uh, I, do remember that one. Hmm. I forgot I, what number it was i can't remember which, uh, hand, which one it was either question? oh i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> is that a bill for this session doug yes mm. okay mm -hmm. i hadn't heard about that we, we have, we're about halfway through. I don't remember if that one made it onto the summary or not. It might, Doug, but, we'll, but I do remember hearing that one as well. It, it might have been in Assemblyman Han, uh, Assemblywoman Hanson's AB 263. It might have been part of that as well. I don't I'll know. I'll double check I and get you information on I that. I don't remember. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll double check and get you information on that. Uh, moving on though, Assembly Bill 264. Uh, this one sets forth again some requirements uh, in regards to removing folks who are ineligible to vote uh, and authorizing the Secretary of State to enter certain agreements. Uh, again, going back to list maintenance, uh, again, there's, there's a number of different ways that we're looking at improving the process. Um, currently, there's no statute, for example, that allows us to coordinate with certain federal agencies. Uh, it's interesting when I've reached out and talked to some of my counterparts and, and asked about the resources they use on the federal side of the house. Um, they say, well, you know, it turns out, you know, this organization over here, the first question they ask is, tell us the name of the statute that allows you to even ask us for help in the first place. Um, so this, this bill, again, is, is one of those that tries to address that sort of federal and state requirement. Uh, AB 297, uh, this one changes so that the two registrars of voter offices that we have currently uh, would no longer be appointed by their Board of County Commissions, uh, but instead would be an elected office. I would be okay with that, <laughs> but I'm not in the Nevada legislature, so. AB 321, uh, this is the one that was mentioned earlier, Doug, uh, Appreciate that. Uh, some significant changes, you know, and again, it was interesting as we kind of did this summary, some of these had so many changes that it was almost, you know, really like a couple pages, but we kind of attempted to condense. Um, this would, uh, the bottom line on this one though, in addition to a number of other changes would um, require the uh, universal vote by mail for every election uh, going forward, primary and general special elections as well. Uh, it would adjust slightly some of the timelines um, there's a number of, again, requirements for the Secretary of State to enter in agreements from you know, vital statistics. Uh, there were some changes to clerk and registrar uh, powers and duties as well. Um, and, and it would, the, the parts at the bottom there that would repeal provisions, uh, but it, basically everything that talked about absent ballots and mailing ballots and affected elections, all that would be swept to the side because it would simply state every election, every active registered voter going forward would, re would receive uh, a mail-in ballot. 
Mark, if I may, this is Gail. And just to clarify, it isn't a mail-in election only. The that's, state that's would be running point. two elections. Yes. The early that's voting, exactly right. the, the vote um, election day, plus every voter would active registered voter would be sent a ballot. So the states that use all mail-in ballots, that's all they do. They don't run polling places like Washington and Colorado and and so we just have to be clear on that, that we're not taught, we're talking about running simultaneous elections, basically, yeah, or at yeah, least two different yeah. ways to participate. That, and that's an excellent point. You're right. It really would be in person if that's what you desire or mail in if that's what you desire, um, but with both being fully available as before. Um, that's an excellent point. That is, it's, um, I'm not going to talk about the cost again, but Gail, thank you for that clarification, because I certainly thought that when they said making this permanent, that it would be just mail ballots. So I appreciate that, thank you. For Assembly Bill 328, uh, this is the one that, uh, again, the, the intent here, this ties back into uh, voter list maintenance. Uh, authorizes the funeral director to notify the, the county clerk of the death of an individual um, in, in order to help facilitate that process. Um, and this would be in addition to what we currently do with the Bureau of Vital Statistics. AB 390, uh, this, there was a- I'm sorry, Mark. Yes, ma'am. That previous bill, okay, the one that, maybe a little bit more clarification on this about okay. the notification. I live in a senior community and there are a lot of people up here that it, they think that once their loved one passes away that their registration is canceled and they don't have to worry about getting information. I, for one, I thought that was the case. So if you can clarify what this process could be if this bill passed and perhaps Doug, if you, you know, have any input on this, that would be great. Certainly. So the, the I'll tell you the as is process. We, maybe we could start there. Um, okay. So the way it currently works is that when an individual across the state passes away, uh, the funeral director or the coroner already notifies the Bureau of Vital Statistics. The, the Bureau of Vital Statistics points of contact that we, we liaise with, uh, they, they consider their information direct from the source. Um, so they, they get it from everybody already. They, they so compile. that's how you get your death certificate, right? Yes, ma'am. In, in addition yeah. to, we're also part of the ERIC uh, organization, the Electronic Registration Information Center. We, we get additional uh, death information from them as well. Um, but the uh, Bureau of Vital Statistics gets their information directly from the source. They also get injects from the Social Security Administration and, and a number of other organizations. They collect all that information and then they provide that to us uh, five days a week now, Monday to Friday, they send it to us. Uh, we take that information, we look at it, we divide it up across the, uh, the counties to make it applicable for that county clerk or registrar. And then we provide that information to the clerk or registrar so that they can conduct their, their list maintenance uh, and remove those individuals who are deceased. Now, the, the county clerk is responsible for the voter rolls. I thought that was the secretary of state. They're, they're responsible for conducting their list maintenance. Uh, the way the process works currently, uh, because we're a, a bottom-up system, uh, ultimately each county clerk and registrar maintains the, the base, database, so to speak, uh, of all the, the registered voters uh, in that county. Uh, and then every night they provide that information to us in a nightly file that we aggregate for, to, to build the statewide voter registration list. Oh, okay. Okay, well, hopefully this is something that'll pass if that's all there is to it, where there's notification and names are removed from the and, uh, voter rolls. And, and this, this is a, the, the sort of, of, of recommendation too, that, I mean, quite frankly, it, it seems a little bit redundant, but redundancy is good. If, if there's any question, uh, you know, ultimately if, if we're getting more information than not to assist with voter list maintenance, uh, you know, I tend to agree that there, there's a number of things that we can do to, to make sure that, that again, we're not missing anybody. Thank you. 
Assembly Bill 390. Uh, this one again, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, goes back to uh, the notification of a contest be provided to the candidate whose election is being contested. Uh, you would think that if uh, an individual was going to contest an election, um, that they would have to notify already the other side or the individual that, that won, or um, but that's not the case. Uh, so I understand this is an intent to clarify that and, and make sure that that uh, happens. Uh, Assembly's Joint Resolution 13. Uh, this one is a change to the, con the state constitution, um, changing it so that instead of the Supreme Court canvassing the vote, uh, this would change it to the legislature. Uh, the intent here also uh, in my discussion with somebody in the middle about it uh, was so that if there were questions uh, about the, the canvas, uh, it, it would, well, one, it would require a special session after every election uh, for them to come together to canvas the vote, uh, but that also that way they were able, they would, they would be able uh, to establish a commission or discuss if there were any questions or concerns about the election. Mark, bring yes, a point here for the record. On this, on this joint resolution, wouldn't this wind up being something that the people of the state would have to vote on? I mean, if you're talking about amending the state constitution, doesn't have to go through a process to get on the ballot. So is this where these things that wind up on the ballot start as a resolution in the legislative session? Yes, ma'am. It, it, it's one of the ways, for sure. Oh, uh, okay. Other than petition, because I've seen the petition process before. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, SB 130. Uh, this one, again, is a presidential primary. Uh, this one, though, would, would change it so that the presidential preference primary election would, would happen during the, the normal statewide primary election. SB 225, uh, again, a number of requirements in this one, uh, including changes to uh, regulations about I ID, um, audits of elections. Uh, this is the one, actually, it looks like, uh, Doug, this is the one with the unique ballot identification. Yeah, I just this is it, yeah. Yep, uh, SB 225, good, so it did get on here. Uh, again, some changes to the processing of absent ballots and mailing ballots. Um, and then a number of other changes too, including uh, requirements for computer programs for mechanical voting systems and, and devices. And also repealing some mail ballot uh, <clears throat> and emergency, the, the, the idea of an affected election as well. SB 256. Um, so this one, uh, when I talked to Senator Kikepfer about it, uh, the, the intent here is so that um, in, in talking with him, he said he wants it so that an individual's involvement um, with the, the, you know, the, the civic processes specific to in, initiatives and referendum uh, is made easier. Um, currently, uh, you know, when, when we were talking, we, we cited the reference of, uh, you know, it's possible to buy a house using your phone and digitally signing it using DocuSign. Uh, but if you want to sign a petition or a referendum, uh, there's a number of requirements that you're doing it in person, what signatures and, and these sorts of things. Uh, so he, he's attempting to, to incorporate some of the, the use of technology uh, into this process so that it's more accessible, but also more secure. SB 270 uh, updates the list of constitutional officers who can solicit or accept political contributions during certain periods. Uh, this expands it to include the Secretary of State, uh, treasurer and, and really all um, uh, of the other uh, constitutional officers. SB 292, uh, this changes it so that uh, the ballot in the general election would have the ability to be uh, a straight uh, partisan race, a straight ticket so that you could click a button and then you know, you'd be voting for all Republicans or all Democrats, um, which is something currently that the the systems that we have are able to do and, and do uh, in other states, uh, but, but have not done here. Um, there's also a number of other changes to some qualifications for minor political parties, uh, raising it from 1% to 2% uh, and a number of other deadlines and requirements as well. It, Mark, yes, for your point, 
How would that work for racists that are on the ballot that are nonpartisan? Uh, it's my assumption that if you click the button for, uh, and I can double check and get back to you, but if, if you click the one, it would only highlight the individuals who are partisan, uh, the ones that were nonpartisan, and they would be left blank, so that it would still require your input. Hmm, well, that could be misleading and misunderstood. Somebody think they're voting because they can click a button and, you know, vote the, I don't know, that just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but okay. And, and that, that, for example, that would be an excellent part of our voter education campaign uh, that, that we would want to get out and make sure people were aware of. Uh, th this is Doug. Uh, the, the system outlined by Senator Lang in this is that you would, for, it doesn't apply to nonpartisan races, uh, but it also allows, if the voter were to check the box to vote all Democratic, but then later on down the ballot decided to vote for another candidate, not mm -hmm. of that party, uh, the that vote overrides the uh, all part, the uh, ticket oh, vote. The uh, party line uh, vote. It's, I've, I've got other opinions about this bill I won't share. <laughs> oh, okay, I think I may share them with you, so. I don't know, it just raises an eyebrow about something like that, especially when, and then of course you have the judicial races that are in there. I mean, I think a lot could go wrong with uh, that kind of process. So hopefully that will not pass. There's a reason only six other states do it. Uh, we're almost done. I promise. This is uh, side twenty-eight or thirty. <laughs> so you don't, uh, in case someone thought they that they're in like an endless loop. Uh, we're approaching the end. Uh, SB three hundred one. Uh, this one again, uh, interestingly uh, and similar to S um, to Assembly Bill three twenty-one. Uh, and, and like uh, Gail had mentioned, this would have a universal vote by mail, but also would allow the in-person voting. Um, the, the difference is here is that. Uh, the senators are proposing differences in the deadlines for counting, uh, and there's a number of other uniform requirements and changes, um, as well as making the registrar of voters in elected office and, and a number of other provisions as well. <clears throat> and, and before I jump into HR1, the, the one other bill that I saw just this morning, uh, Assembly Bill, I believe it's 422, uh, is one that proposes the, uh, the transition to a top-down voter registration system um, by January 1st of 2022. Okay, so <laughs> Brenda Flank here, what could go wrong with this? I don't know. There are people out there that don't want to vote. They don't want to be part of the system. Why are they automatically registered? It, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, there are a lot of things on this HR1 that could be discussed, but I'll just, I was expressing myself, Mark. That's yes, ma'am. Okay. No, and uh, yes, ma'am. So it, real fast in regards to AB 422, uh, again, the, uh, the top-down voter registration system, uh, you know, in the next roughly eight months uh, would be a fiscal and programmatic challenge. Um, but we're in the process of building, uh, again, we've solicited the clerks and registrar's feedback, um, and, and we're working on our fiscal note to discuss that one currently. In regards to HR1, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion about this on the national level, certainly. Um, I, I'm pleased that I can honestly zone that out and focus purely on the impacts to Nevada and voters. Um, right. Thankfully, there's a lot of provisions in here uh, that, again, I'm, I'm very proud to say are things that we already do. Uh, you know, same day and automatic voter registration, uh, you know, the, the idea of, of uh, you know, no excuse absent ballots. Um, so that there's a lot of things that already that we do that are in HR1 that are, are you know, some of my, again, uh, counterparts in other states uh, are pulling their hair out over trying to figure out how they would implement this here in the very near future. Uh, there are certainly some changes that would be required uh, for here in Nevada. Um, and certainly a lot of those, again, given the timelines identified, at least in the draft of HR1 and the amended versions that we keep our eyes closely on, uh, would have a significant fiscal impact as well. Um, you know, you either do something, again, fast and quick, 
uh, or I'm sorry, was it cheap, fast or right? And uh, again, in these cases, like it's, it's just gonna be expensive uh, moving forward. Uh, but this is something again, that we're, we're really bottom line, keeping an eye, our eye closely on uh, and making sure that, that every time there's a discussion that we do see, and, and again, I'm uh, partly je you know, jesting about not paying attention to the national news media. I, I keep my head firmly into that so I can hear what other states are concerned with uh, and make sure that those concerns do not apply to us uh, or the, the way they're interpreting these laws, you know, the proposed bill, um, again, is, is not going to impact or, or will impact us. Uh, you know, now we can identify that as a concern. Uh, but, but bottom line, we're keeping an eye closely on it and we're prepared to, uh, to adjust and make sure that folks are educated uh, if this does come to fruition. Uh, and there's a similar one, S1, uh, that's being discussed in the Senate as well um, with, with similar but slightly different uh, requirements. Mark. Yes, ma'am. Um, back to HR1. Oh, was that the last? It, it was, yes. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. When you look at HR1, the things mm -hmm. that are being required, for instance, uh, banning purging of voter rolls, that's getting people off the rolls that should not be on them. Does the Secretary of State's office have any input, any say, any, I don't know what's the best way to put it. What input does the Secretary of State have with, for instance, with this HR1? So in, in regards Secretary to- Secretary of State's office, the election, department. Yes, ma'am. And, and uh, I know the secretary is on. I'm not sure if Secretary Sigaski would like to take that question or uh, I, I think that, that the bottom line is we, we look closely at it. Uh, and from our point of view, we were prepared to provide fiscal impacts uh, and an awareness of second and third order effects. Um, we, we make sure that, that there's a number of individuals. Oh, I saw the secretary's number. I'm, I'm, yep, I'm on. Yes, ma'am. Is it only about me? the fiscal impact? Because it, it, voting and our voter rolls information goes way beyond just the physical or uh, financial impact. Yes, can hear you, it Barbara, also, Secretary. Okay, yeah, Barbara's on. Right. In, in the integrity right. of our process. So okay, I, I'm just going, all I'm going to answer, Brenda, is your question about um, us being involved. We are not involved. We are not asked for input on any of these bills. Um, our staff has been diligent in calling and asking the uh, legislators if they want any help or want any assistance. We send every one of them a letter when we find out something. Um, sometimes we don't find out till the day of the hearing. It just depends. So we do the best we can, but no, we are not involved because their choice, not ours. We okay. have asked to be involved. And so the only time we are involved is when we get put on, um, uh, you know, when we can talk on the record in opposition or in favor of something. So I'm going to mute myself again because I'm getting ready to go. But if you need anything else, I'll be here. Thank you. Okay, so the legislators put forth a bill that's going to impact, I mean, it's gonna have ramifications all over the place, but the Secretary of State's office can't do anything about it. I mean, the fact that they have no input just really surprises me that something is not said. I mean, you know, some clarification other than the economic impact that it would have. We Again, we, we offer to provide uh, assistance and discussion, and, and, and there are, I do want to reassure you, there are a number of legislators who have taken us up on that uh, and said, yes, I would like to hear your thoughts. And, uh, you know, we let them know that, that when we look at a bill, we go to the clerks and registrars because we want to make sure that we understand that the, the full scope of the impacts to the state, uh, we bring these up. And, and if, if, you know, some of the clerks say, well, here's a concern that, that maybe they're just the 
tweak in the wording here uh, makes it more practical, reduces the timeline, makes it, you know, here, here's the realistic impact to saying uh, only two days to do this or only one day to do this when they're, uh, the, you know, here's the, here's the resources I have available, like the number of people, the number of things that we have going on. And this is why even just three days would make a, a huge difference. We, we gather up all that information. And again, there, there have been plenty of, of legislators who have said, let me know what impacts this could have or what concerns you would have or, or you know, across the state. And, and we present that to them. Uh, so, so there is some level of, of a dialogue. Um, okay, so it has to come from the legislators before you guys actually have input on things that are happening in the session. Yes, uh, I mean, it, it they don't ask. If they don't ask, then it just takes the next step. Well, and, and even, I mean, there's a number of ways to the process, but yeah, even if, if they don't ask, we generally will reach out if it's concerning, uh, you know, whatever the concern is to make sure they're aware of it. Um, so it's-, okay. it's So on we are, HR1, are there some concerns that Secretary of State's office has, Barbara, if you're still on, are there some concerns in HR1 that you have addressed with anyone in the legislative uh, session that's going on now. I, I have to keep on muting myself and then do the star six. So that's why it takes okay. me a little longer. Um, Brenda, HR1, we, um, we do a lot of it that's in there uh, for the elections, but we did uh, write a letter to our uh, Senator and it was CC to all of the Congress people and we'd be more than happy to share with you what we sent. But our concerns, a lot of our concerns are the money, you know, the cost. And um, Mark, you can talk a little bit about what you did. He did a really good job on the letter and um, we sent it to Catherine Cortez Masto. And then, as I said, we did it to the other congressional just to give them heads up. So okay, but we, what again, are not, oh, pardon? All right. Um, uh, HR one is. Are we talking about the HR one, or do we have one here in our state? Well, no. HR one is is um, national. Congress. Right. Um, yeah, that's the congressional one. Um, okay. What we have, I don't know of anything locally that we have other than um, AB three twenty four. I think that's the number, isn't it? Or is it three twenty one? I can't keep track of the numbers anymore. Um, but yeah, so that those things kind, of, kind of our stance, but other. yeah, okay. but let Mark talk about the letter a little bit. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. thank you, Madam Secretary. And, and to be clear, it's, you know, again, there's a lot of discussion about HR1 across the country. Um, even when I've, I've listened closely on, on, on the discussions on both sides of the aisle, um, I can step back and say, well, what truly is the impact to Nevada? What do, what do we have? What, you know, there are folks that are, are raising all sorts of concerns, but, but there are things that we already have in statute that we already do and, and do well and are, there, there's not even a concern. So, so arguments like that, I, I, I'm not as much worried about you know, the, the concerns about. Well, um, that's, that was my concern because there are a lot of things that happen on a national level that are later raised in different states. And then you have legislators that are looking at the same thing that they could not get done nationally. They're doing it in the states. And that's, that's what I was looking at, the mirror of these two bills, the, the impact that it could have. So well, if we have things that are in our state that are in HR1 and then have HR1, I mean, this just codifies things that should never, I mean, that should be at least discussed. Well, and I understand your concerns. And, uh, you know, when we looked at HR1, uh, automatic voter registration, same day registration, uh, the, the required use of voter verifiable paper ballots with all uh, voting machines, uh, early voting periods, no excuse requests for absent ballots, multilingual ballots and elections assistance materials, um, phone number for state specific elections related questions, signature verification processes for mail in ballots. Those are all things that we already do that, that are discussed in our legislature. And, and as you saw from these bills that are still under discussion, again, some folks want to. I'm sorry. 
We uh, send out multilingual ballots. It, it's just two, right? So depending two on language. the county, there, there's a requirement uh, based on the percentages, and this is all part of, it's kind of tied to the census as well. Um, if there's a percentage of individuals in that county that have uh, that speak a different language, uh, we're, we're federally required to provide ballot information in that other language. Uh, currently in Clark County, for example, uh, English, Spanish, uh, and I believe Tagalog uh, as well, with, with some discussion that there might be Mandarin in the near future. A uh, federal requirement, we're already in compliance with it. Hmm. Brenda, this is Doug. Uh, just, uh, just, uh, Doug. Just, a, uh, just to clarify some things on the input from the Secretary of State's office to the legislature on bills, the Secretary uh, said it very accurately, it's their choice, not the office's choice. And that goes back to last session. Uh, there were several bills in the 2019 session as well uh, where this whole trend started and it's very regrettable, but that's the way it is. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Doug. Yes, ma'am. So Mark, one of the questions that came over on the Facebook page, because you were just talking about same day registration, automatic registration, it gets confusing. So somebody was asking, how do we judge the or determine the validity or the eligibility of a voter? And I know because I'm a certified field registrar down here in Clark County, that if if the person has a DMV issued ID, we use that. Mm -hmm. And so if, whether you're doing it with a paper form, um, if they go online, the only way you get into the system is if you have a record with the DMV. For automatic voter registration, it's an opt out system. So unless you say, I don't want to be registered to vote, then you get registered to vote. But again, you're standing there at the DMV with your ID. Exactly. Um, same day voter registration, you have to have an ID. So it's actually a small group of people that don't have that ID that require a social security number, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, very yes. small percentage. Again, the numbers, especially when you look at it in view of the, the 1.8 million active registered voters, it's a, it's a fraction of a fraction. Yes, because okay. I know, yeah, because we either ask for the DMV issued ID or the social security number. You have to have one or the other. It, DMV issues two different IDs, right? So if, you, if you're doing automatic voter registration at the DMV, mm -hmm. the only time you're offered, the only time you are registered to vote is if you are doing a transaction that is related to you having to have showed them that you're a U.S. citizen and eligible to vote. So it can't be like if you're registering in your car. Um, but it could be for an ID or a driver's license. Okay. And, and you are right that there are different types of IDs that the DMV okay. provides. So if, if you use one of the 15 immigration documents, for mm -hmm. example, uh, then you get a driver's authorization card that is not a driver's license. Right. Uh, and a driver's well, authorization card isn't. does not authorize you to register to vote. Oh, okay. So there is some clarification on the types of IDs that are used that people present as they transact business there at DMV for them to be automatically registered because right. we know that there are different types of IDs. Okay. Right, it's built into their computer system. Mm -hmm. So when you're interacting with the agent, the only time the agent is notified that they're registering you to vote is if you are doing a transaction that's related to one of the forms of ID that we use for voter registration. Okay. Yeah, I know there was a lot of regulatory hearings and trying to figure that all out. And they were very, very, very aware that they needed to be clear. There was only those mm -hmm. two forms of ID. Okay. Okay, thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a lot of bills. And I know they're still submitting bills. Does anybody have questions for Mark about any of the bills? So um, one thing I wanted to say about voter ID, because there are, there are a couple of them that, that say that they want it to have voter ID. Some of them actually allow for the, the voter to get a free ID from the DMV. And I know in 2015 that that was a recommendation. The DMV came with a fiscal note and it was in the millions of dollars because they were gonna to have to hire more people and they were gonna to have to go through things. But can you, Mark, can you talk a little bit about the 24th Amendment and not having a poll tax and how that kind of factors in? So uh, yeah, that, and certainly in regards to the, the ID piece, you know, the, and, and bring up the 24th Amendment, certainly that, that's a key part of it, right? The idea is that you don't wanna have obstacles to people coming to, to vote. Uh, and that's, that's typically the, the, the argument against having a voter ID. The idea is that, 
Uh, while many Americans, uh, again, in the course of their routine conduct of their day, uh, have a license or some sort of ID that, that is provided by the state, uh, the reality is that not everybody has one or needs one. Um, and, and so that would create an extra hurdle really uh, that they would have to overcome to, to, uh, to vote. Um, and, and in many cases, that's suggested as being something that would disenfranchise uh, a, you know, decent swaths of people uh, that, again, that are of a type of uh, employment that if you don't really need an ID, uh, that, that kind of starts to shift the demographic that we're talking about. Uh, and then it becomes viewed as a, as a particularly partisan uh, and concerning issue for, for a number of folks. So, for instance, I know, um, Brenda, there's a lot of sometimes older women who might have a driver's license now, and then for some health reason, they don't want to drive anymore, but their husband has a driver's license, and so she gives up her ID, doesn't renew it, and then he passes away, and we have found a couple of instances where then the woman is trying to find her birth certificate and realizes that the county courthouse burned down in her hometown, and no one can find the birth certificate anymore. Now you've got somebody who may be voting for their whole life that all of a sudden can't vote because she can't get her birth certificate. But she uh, another vote. example, when I was in the service, uh, I knew active duty Marines who didn't have a driver's license because they grew up in a city, never needed to drive in, in had public transportation. Um, so it wasn't until they got their military ID that they had an actual state issued ID at the age of like 24 or so. Right. But Jeff the, they can vote. I mean, there's still uh, absentee ballots that are available. If this if, person voted over right. the years, they verify signatures. I See, think the, but that's the key. In our state, we use signature, not, not the actual voter ID, the ID. Right, but I'm saying if we were to go to voter ID, and of course the, the 24th Amendment and the poll tax, that's an, a different you know, kind of discussion, I think, but to say that people would necessarily be disenfranchised if voter ID were required at the polls, there's still that option to vote absentee because their signature is on file. They are a registered voter. They can still vote. So there is no disenfranchisement just because or if we were to have voter ID to vote at the polls. It depends on how the legislation is passed. If the legislation requires everyone, everyone before they vote the next time to show an ID, so it's kind of retroactive, you could end up having people being disenfranchised. If it would be just going forward, then you are right. If somebody already had their signature on file and they're a registered voter, that would be maintained. But then, then we would want to make sure that if somebody couldn't order their birth certificate because they couldn't pay for the birth certificate, that those those kind of costs would be absorbed by the state. And that's that's what we looked at in 2015. And it was a couple of million dollars in order for the DMV to assure everybody that no one was going to be told they couldn't get an ID. Brenda, there's also some requirements or some proposals that include uh, people submitting copies of their ID with their absentee slash mail ballot uh, out there. So well, I don't like that idea, but yeah. <laughs> uh, that that sounds a bit much to That's an interesting perspective, but I think that the notion that people would be disenfranchised from voting just because there would be a requirement to verify who you are when you go to the polls, that whole notion is just, it's, it's it doesn't make any sense. There are too many options for people to vote. There's plenty of time for people to vote should they choose if that's what they want to do. As long as they're mailing out ballots, I'm not seeing where there's any disenfranchisement. Okay. If you're on the voter rolls, you have the opportunity to vote. But there are people that would, that there's some security associated with that right, your civic duty to vote. So if someone wants to go and vote in person to make sure that their ballot is cast, great, they'll have that opportunity. But disenfranchisement is just not something that we can do, at least in this state, with right. all the options that we have. Right. So, uh 
Anybody have any questions on any of the, the bills? Okay. So uh, thank you, Mark. I know there's like a, a you, lot Mark. of those bills and you did a really good job of helping us kind of understand the differences between them. So I really appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there, there was a, a pretty good uh, summary I've heard uh, you did a few weekends ago, which I appreciate as well, getting the word out about all of them. And it, it's certainly a challenge to stay up on, but I know that the entirety of the division is keeping close eyes on all of these, tracking changes, making sure that we understand the impacts and, and, and are able to provide you know, honest and accurate assessments uh, based on the impacts. Awesome. So um, I know the top-down systems come up a couple of times, and I wasn't aware that bill had, had popped up, so I'm going to look at that. Do you think in, in a future meeting that we could just devote maybe a, one of your presentations to explaining what that top-down system entails? I very much would like that. Uh, absolutely. Because okay. I've kind of heard some explanations, but uh, there's part bits and pieces that, that I'm unclear about. So uh, that would be really helpful. Okay. All righty. Um, unfortunately, Janie had to jump off because she needed to go to another meeting. So... Um, on the agenda, the next item is actually um, agenda item number seven, and that's the Gene Ford Democracy Award. But we're gonna need some more time to, to kind of work on that to decide if it's something we can do this year. So what I'm gonna ask for is a motion to table that agenda item until a future meeting. Move to table. Okay, thank you, Doug, a second. Brenda Flank, second. Brenda, second, okay. Um, all in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 But Sandra, is this something that we could also address by email? Um, yeah, the part that we need to do has to, needs to be done in an open meeting. Ah, okay. Um, and then I know we've got a subcommittee, and so we need to, to make sure that they can meet, and there's a few things that need to happen, and then we need to make a decision in the meeting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I, I told Janie that we would just hold her report in abeyance, so that she can do it at the next meeting for sure. So I just need a motion to hold agenda item number eight in abeyance. I move to hold agenda item number eight in abeyance. And a second. Brenda okay. Flank, second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. So moving on to um, agenda item number nine, and I kind of jumped the gun a little bit to ask for, I would like to report on that top down system. Um, anything else that you would uh, make a recommendation either for Mark to do a presentation or just an issue that you would like to talk about? Can we put the Gene Ford Award on that next agenda? Yeah, so because it's tabled, yeah, I'll, I'll, it'll automatically pop up to the top. Okay. Anything else? Okay, and then committee members, if, if as legislation is going through, if we need to, we can always uh, email Mark and, and Gail and make sure that the next agenda has uh, your concern listed on it. And then for agenda item number 10 for possible action is the date and time of the next meeting. Um, I'll just go ahead and say what we'll do is we'll coordinate with the secretary because it's always nice to have her on uh, in case she needs to chime in and then we'll coordinate with Mark. Uh, and Mark's life is going to get super busy with all these bills, I can tell. Uh, but I'm always glad to see when you're um, at the hearings and you pop on and kind of explain things. So I really appreciate that. Uh, you, okay. Mark. And then um, agenda item number 11 is just any, any remaining comments uh, by the Democracy, uh, Advisory Committee on Participatory Democracy Committee members. So are there any remaining comments? Brenda Flank. Uh, go ahead, Brenda. I, it was a great meeting. It was good to see you guys. I can't believe it's been since August that we've met. So uh, happy new year. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's when I was trying to go back to see what the minutes were from the last meeting. I'm like, oh my goodness, it was all the way back in August that we did this right. last time. And that's when we were all grilling poor Wayne as he was trying to figure out what was in AB4. And he, he did an excellent job and Mark, you did an excellent yeah. job. Great All right. Thank you. So now we're going to go to the, the second public comment, and I'm going to go ahead and go over to the Facebook page and put in the number and the, the ID number, the meeting ID number, so that anybody that would like to call in can call in. And I do see somebody in the waiting room, so I'm going to go ahead and admit them. 
All right, so the, the person who was just admitted, uh, can you go ahead and we're gonna give you three minutes for your public comment. We need their name, please, for the minutes. Okay. Okay, so the person that just uh, entered the meeting, can you go ahead and unmute and state, state your name and then do your public comment? Hi, this is Carmen Avello, formerly Carmen Amen. Oh, Carmen. Yeah. Yes, it's me. It's you. Okay. It just says, it said iPhone, so I wasn't sure. So that Carmen's actually a committee member. Carmen, this is Gail. When did you join? Have you been here? Oh, I joined. You mean the call today? The call, yes. Yeah, I, I've been here for about five minutes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't see anybody else, but um, Ed Gonzalez was the person that was uh, trying to do public comment at the very beginning and was unable to uh, stay to the end. So he's not able to call in right now. So what I did is I copied his comment from the Facebook page and I've put it into the chat and I will save the chat and make sure that all the, the comments and everything from the Facebook page goes to the Secretary of State and goes to uh, Mark, Mr. Valentian. Okay, because I, I do, I want to make sure I really appreciate when people are willing to, to tune in and get all the information and make sure that they have correct information. So I want to make sure your comments get over to uh, Barbara and Mark. And I was, I was mentioning before the meeting started, it is so hard in Nevada to do meetings because you know everybody and then you're like, uh, Barbara, who are you, Barbara? Oh, you're the Secretary of State. That's right. Because everybody, everybody in, in Nevada is so nice and it's so easy to get to know people. So I always appreciate all of you. Okay, so it looks like we are now um, at that point of the meeting uh, for adjournment. And before we adjourn, uh, again, wanna thank Gail for staying with us because she's always helped, she helps us with our agenda, the Secretary of State for being available to answer questions. And Mark, you made it, blank stars, Ooh, good job. <laughs> thank you. Uh, but we really appreciate it because I know that there's not always time to get into the weeds on things. And so I really appreciate that, that Wayne and now you are able to answer all our questions and this is re being recorded so that other people will be able to, to take advantage of it and understand these processes. Oh, well, I, I truly appreciate the invite. And I'm honored to be able to represent the staff and the secretary uh, here today. And, and certainly if you do have any questions now or later, please don't hesitate to reach out and I'll get you to answer as quickly as possible. Perfect. Okay, so I just need a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. And then a second. Second. Okay, I'll second. A second. All right. So the meeting is adjourned. And now, now before you leave, I have to ask, um, show me your Zoom wave. <laughs> Bye. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>